Hello, this is the next video in a playlist that I'm calling Parameter Estimation. And here we're going to look at the Fisher Name and Factorization Theorem. And this is a follow-up video to a video I called Sufficient Statistic. And there, to derive a sufficient statistic, we had to look at the conditional distribution of the data given the value of the sufficient statistic. And if it was independent of the parameter that we're trying to estimate, then it was a sufficient statistic. But that whole process can be pretty darn tedious. And this Fisher name and factorization theorem is a much easier approach to finding sufficient statistics than using the definition. And so in this video, we're going to state the theorem and prove it for both discrete and continuous case. And then in the next video, we're going to uh, provide several examples. So let's let xi, i from 1 to n, be uh, iid random variables with pdf or pmf f of xi uh, given theta, with theta in the parameter space omega, which is a real number. Okay, so in this theorem, we're looking at real valued uh, variables or you know parameters. And an equivalent theorem and proof can be done for vector valued functions. A statistic, call it t, and we'll just write it as t, but really it's a function of the data, uh, is sufficient for theta if and only if uh, the joint density or PMF can be factored as follows into h and k, where both h and k are non negative functions, and note that h is not a function of theta, only of the data, and two, k depends upon theta and the data, but only through the sufficient statistic t. And so this is the proof. So in an if and only if, we have to assume this and we prove that it factors, and then we assume that it factors and we prove that it's sufficient. And so this is the proof. So first let's do it for the discrete case. So let x be discrete. And then we're going to prove it this way, uh, from left to right first. So let's let t be a sufficient statistic for theta. We're also going to let uh, our domain be defined this way, a of t. And that is, um, you know, the vector, all our data. So this is n, so it's in n space, such that our sufficient statistic equals t. Um, so note when x of t is in this set, then the joint distribution of x and t is really just equal to the joint distribution of x. And the reason is when, when we define the set like this, which is 100% legit and fine, that every combination of the x's creates the uh, the sufficient statistic or makes it equal little t. So when we add in little t to the joint distribution of here, it, it's already, you know, we're creating these x's to make it equal little t. So you, you don't really need that. And that's why it's equal to just the joint distribution. And this is a clever trick in how to define the domain. And then the, and little t can be anything, you know, you know all, all real numbers. And so when it's defined like that, it, it makes the proof easier. So let's let the joint distribution of f of x, which is equal to this, right? We just showed that. And then this joint distribution can be broken up into conditional distribution. So f of x given t and f of t. And this is equal to, you, you know, just redefine it. Remember, t is a sufficient statistic. So this is independent of theta. So it's a function of just the x's. And then the, the distribution of t given theta is, well, it's a function of both t and theta. And so thus the joint distribution factors. Okay, so we proved it one way. 
So now let's prove it the other way. So go backwards. Let's assume that the joint distribution factors according to the theorem into H of X and K of T and theta. So now we need to show that this uh, distribution is independent of theta, right? So, and if this is independent of theta, it means T is a sufficient statistic for theta. So this joint distribution can be written like this, right? It's just conditional probability. So it's the, the joint of X and T divided by the distribution of T. Well, remember that we're in the set, X is in the set A of T. So really this can be thought of as just F of X, right? So that's the same. Now here, and I have a, a, a playlist called Transformations. And when you want to transform uh, or find this distribution of T, which is a function of the X's, and in the discrete case, you sum over all possible values of X that makes capital T equal to little t. Well, that's that set A of T. And then this is the original joint distribution. So when you sum over all possibilities like where X is in A of T, then you, and then so you get this distribution, right? So this is how you transform it to that. So we're kind of going backwards. Now, since the assumption is that we could uh, factor these, this joint distribution, we factor it. Now, the key step here is this, that when X is in A of T, so every combination of X that makes T, capital T, equal little t, right? That, that's the definite, that's what this sum means. So really, T is always little t, right? Because we're com creating those X's that make this a constant for every combination of that X. So since it's a constant, it actually can be factored out front. Well, then it cancels with that. And we're left with just the H and then this. Well, there's no theta in here. This is independent of theta. Well, then t then thus uh, t is a sufficient statistic for theta. And then we've proved the discrete case. Now let's assume x is continuous. And let's let's prove it left or right. So let's let t and, I, and I'm going to put a 1 here and you'll see in a second. Let T1 be sufficient for theta, right? And then that means F of X given T1 is independent of theta. And again, we're going to define the set that we're in, our, our domain is A of T, and that's all X's in, in, in space, such that T1 is equal to little t. Now note that T1 is really a function of the X's, right? That's that's because it's a statistic, right? So it has to be a function of the x's. And we're saying t1 is sufficient, okay? Now, it's, it is a function of the x's, okay? So we want to create n minus 1 more t's that are functions of the data. But we're going to do it such that the transformation is 1 to 1 and the Jacobian exists and is not 0. So that means this transformation T goes from in space, right? Because we have a sample of size N, and it maps it to in space, right? Because we have N of these T's. Now let's let the vector capital T equal to T1, T2, to Tn. But remember that those Tj's are really functions of the data. So it's H of J of X. And this is uh, from j equals 1 to n. So each one of these are really functions of x's. But also we could go backwards. So if we let x equal this vector x equal 1 through xn, these little x's, we can back solve all this. So each xj is really hj inverse of t, right? Because you could, since we created this 1 to 1 function, we can back solve for the x's, and that's what that's what this represents, right? So this is from one to n. 
Okay, so now that oh, that's out of the way, the uh, joint distribution of T, you know, that vector T, is this. It is the original di joint density of X, right? Uh, evaluated in X, but the, the tricky part is that really these X's are these, they're functions of the T's, right? And that's why this is a function of T, because really this is a function of T, but in reality it's still a function of the X's. And then we have the Jacobian, and so this is the density of, of the vector T, the joint density of the T's. Now to get the distribution or the density of T1, we need to integrate out all the other T's. So we take the joint density, which is this, and we integrate out T2, T3, all the way to Tn. Now, to make this more explicit, this X really can be thought of as this. So, so X1 is H1 inverse of T, you know, all the way to Xn, you know, in here, is really Hn inverse of T. And then the Jacobian comes down and everything is this. So this right here is actually a function of of the x of t. Well, this is a function of t1 and theta. Okay. So now let's look at this joint density of x. And so our assumption was that t1 is a sufficient statistic. And so this is equal to the joint density of x and t1, right? Because the way we defined our domain, these are equal. But then we can use uh, conditional probability to, to do this. So then this is x given t1, and then this is f of t1. And then this right here, since t1 is a sufficient statistic, this is actually just a function of the x's, so call it h of x. And this right here, the... Uh, distribution, the marginal distribution of T1 is actually a function of both theta and T1, and that's what the K is. Well, that's what we needed to show, that the joint distribution of functions or factors into these two, the product of these two functions, and we're done. So now let's prove it the other way. So let F of X factor into these uh, two non-negative functions, H and K. Um, and then here, this is f of x given t1. So we need to show that this is independent of theta. Then that shows that t1 would be a sufficient statistic for theta. So that's what we're trying to do here. So this uh, conditional distribution can be thought of as the joint distribution divided by you know, the marginal of t1. That's just standard probability theory. This right here, the way we defined our domain, x of t, this is really just the same as this. And then this, uh, the function of t1, remember, was derived like this. We found the joint distribution of the t's, and then we integrated out all the other t's except for t1, right? So going from here to here is the same. And of course, x is in uh, x of t. Now, the next step, our assumption was that x factors into these two functions. So let's factor this into this, and this, let's factor this into these two functions. And we get this is this, and then this piece here are, are these. Now, the interesting part here is all these integrals involve t2, t3, all the way up to tn. But note, this is a function of theta and t1. So it's constant in regards to these integral signs. So this piece can be factored out front. It's a constant, right? Well, then that cancels with this. We're just left with h of x divided by this. Now, the Jacobian is a function of the x's. And this joint distribution is a function of the x's, right? And so you can think of it like we would plug in the inverse, you know, your back solve for x. So really it's a function of the, 
the T's, you know, T2, T3, T4, but those are functions of the X's, right? Those are statistics, they're functions of our data. So this whole thing is, is just one big function of the X's. There's no theta here, so this conditional distribution is independent of theta. So this is independent of theta. Thus, T1 is a sufficient statistic. And we've proved a theorem for both continuous and discrete. Well, that's all I have for this video. I um, hope you enjoyed it. I sure did. The next video will be examples of using this factorization theorem. Uh, please like the video and subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Thanks. Bye.